Thank you all for joining us at this Chief Executive Club's event. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome and introduce a Queen's Honorary Graduate, Michael Dowling, as today's guest speaker. Michael is Chief Executive of New York State's largest healthcare provider and private employer, Northwell Health. And I'm really delighted he's joining us today to reflect on his experiences of leading through the COVID-19 pandemic in New York. Michael will share his unique personal experience with us. Interestingly, he'll also share details of how his clinical and administrative teams in the New York health-based private system anticipated such a scenario and prepared years in advance, then stepped up during the height of the pandemic. Being the CEO of a health system in the epicenter of the pandemic has led to some interesting and valuable lessons being learned. Messages that are key take home messages for other health systems and indeed for other leadership teams. Michael shares many of these lessons in his book, Leading Through a Pandemic, which I would recommend to you all. And I'm delighted that he's with us today to share both his personal and professional experience with us. Mark Lawler, Associate Pro Vice Chancellor in the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences, will host the Q&A session following Michael's lecture. So I would encourage colleagues to submit questions via the Q&A function. I know that you'll find this event both informative and enjoyable, as Michael is a captivating and inspiring speaker. Without further delay, I'd now like to hand over to Queen's Honorary Graduate and the Chief Executive of Northville Health, Michael Dowling. Michael, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to be here. I thank you for the invitation, and I uh, look forward to uh, discussion with you over the next hour or so. Um, I also want to uh, say it's uh, wonderful. It's been two years since I was at the university, and I want to say again that um, the hospitality that was shown to me during that visit was just extraordinary, so I want to thank everybody for that again. Uh, I will always remember that, and I can't wait until the travel returns so that I can come back and visit again. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I give you just a little bit of information at the beginning about Northwell Health, because I think it sets the context. I'll make then a few general comments overall. Um, I then will talk a little bit about what went on with us over the past 12 months, especially last spring. Um, there is so much detail here that it's impossible to do everything. So I will just try to summarize. And then I will end up by outlining some leadership issues and challenges, I think, that we now have to face as a result of the, our experience with COVID. And then I will leave ample time for questions, because I often think that during the Q&A is when you can get into the detail that might be more relevant to the audience. So uh, let me show the first slide here. Um, just so you know, as was mentioned, uh, we are the largest uh, healthcare provider in New York State, uh, by far, much, much larger than anybody else. And um, we, um, we are also the largest private employer. So if you see um, the, 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 the map, uh, we are all over the place in the metropolitan New York area, going upstate New York and in all the five boroughs and in Long Island. Um, we have, we have, as you can see, 23 hospitals. We've got six tertiary campuses, two specialty hospitals, a lot of community hospitals. But we also have an extensive array of outpatient ambulatory services, um, 830 plus outpatient locations. These are ambulatory surgery centers, imaging centers, cancer centers, etc. In our situation, you really don't go to the hospital unless you absolutely have to go to the hospital because most services can be provided outside the hospital. We're 14 billion in, 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 in uh, revenue, our, that's our budget this year. Uh, we see a lot of patients, as you know, we have 30% market share in the whole region. Uh, we have 75,000 employees. Uh, we have a very, very large, the second largest in the United States academic teaching facility. We have about 2,000 residents and fellows. We have major research, medical, we have a medical school, nursing school, physician assistant school, et cetera. So we're pretty much, we're very, very comprehensive. There is very little that you would want to get in the healthcare arena that we don't have. So this just gives you a little bit of the context. And we have developed this organization 
over the last 15 years. Um, I've been the CEO for now over 20 years. Um, so let's go to um, uh, a couple of comments about the past year. Um, and it's outlined, uh, a lot of it is outlined in the book that you mentioned. Um, and uh, we can get off that slide, we don't need it now. But um, last, the past year has been pretty unique. As you all know, it's been a unique experience. Um, and most crises that you have uh, happen relatively quickly and they disappear quickly. If you have a, a flood or a hurricane or a bad fire or an outage, it typically will last um, two days, three days, four days, et cetera. The, the uniqueness of this is it has gone on for a year. Uh, we've been at this now for 12 months. Uh, it is just about 12 months ago that we had our first COVID case in our health system. And, um, and we are still working through the, the, the process of dealing with COVID. I will come back to that. Uh, but one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, this experience, um, I believe, and as you all know, has affected everybody. It's just not healthcare. This experience has affected every organization, every individual. Uh, it has, I would argue, changed our perspectives on lots of things. It's changed our individual perspectives on life. It should and has changed, I believe, the organizational perspective, which of course leads to some of the issues that I will come back to at the end. Our environment overall has changed. I don't think we will ever again be exactly the same. And I also would hope and that uh, government, uh, which has been a key player here, an important player, but I hope also that government has learned from this and that it also will change as a result of the COVID experience. And so now, uh, as we're getting out of the COVID circumstance, which I believe, at least here in New York, uh, over the next four, five, six months, I think we should be easing out of the COVID crisis, it lends itself to a lot of leadership challenges for us. And basically, it's how do we create now, as a result of the experience of COVID, how do we create a new future? Uh, but I will come back to this. So let me go back now to uh, our, our experience um, a year ago. This time last year, uh, we were in preparation mode for uh, the uh, oncoming onslaught of COVID. We started preparations in um, January because we were watching what went on in Wuhan and Italy, and we realized that we better get prepared. And there were some people around here that were basically saying that we'll never come to New York. This won't happen. Um, we can't get excited about the possibility, but we realized in our organization that we better get prepared. Uh, so, And we have a very, very good infrastructure here to deal with this. So the first cases, as I said, came at the beginning of March. March 3rd was our first COVID case at one of our smaller community hospitals. And the numbers kept increasing slowly for the first half of March. At the end of March, it accelerated. Numbers increased dramatically. And by, August, by April 6th, we had in our hospitals as COVID inpatients, 3,500 COVID patients in our hospitals on a daily basis. Um, it lasted that way for quite a while. That put, as you can imagine, quite a lot of pressure on the organization because what we had to do to accommodate um, that onslaught of COVID is that we had to shut down a lot of our other services. We had to shut down a lot of ambulatory services. We had to shut down inpatient services. We, have to, we had to limit the number of non-COVID who could come in. Um, a lot of surgery was affected. Now we did, however, um, uh, operate surgery for non-COVID patients all during the crisis, especially those things that absolutely needed to get done. But the issues that you had to deal with on a daily basis during that period of time that fall into four categories. And I could spend an hour on each one of these. Um, what the first one obviously was to, f uh, was to find the bed capacity uh, to accommodate the onslaught of patients. So we ended up on occasion 
creating 100 to 200 new beds a day. The beds were never the biggest issue, I would argue, even though publicly and in the media, there was so much discussion about capacity and bed capacity. Uh, we were relatively, uh, it was relatively easy for us to handle this um, because you can create a bed any place. Uh, you can put beds in lobbies, you can put beds in conference centers, which we did. We reconfigured most of our facilities to accommodate that onslaught. Uh, the second part of the bed issue was um, ICU beds. And this was, again, in many ways, not a big issue, not as big as people made it in the public, because you can turn any bed into an ICU bed if you have a vent. So the issue is the availability of vents, not just the availability of beds. If you have the beds, you can convert them to ICU. That was one whole category of effort that uh, we were working on on a daily basis. Now, one last thing, or another thing I want to mention here. When we started this process in early March, we were all meeting in person in a large command center, which we have here, Disaster um, Emergency Management Command Center. But right away, within the first couple of days, a number of our senior leadership got sick with COVID. And therefore, we had to go remote. So we had to manage the whole operation from the first week on uh, remotely. So we were never together in one location. And that became a leadership issue, although we adapted it, adapted to it very well, but it became a leadership issue. How do you go from the way you normally know how to practice to knowing to, to a, a, a methodology that you had not really experienced before? We are still actually working remotely. We are, don't still all get together in meetings anymore. Uh, hopefully we will over the summer. So that's the bad issue. The second big issue that we had to deal with was supplies, masks, gloves, shields, gowns, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and of course, the testing issue. Now, a couple of points here. We have our own group purchasing organization. I have my own supply chain infrastructure, which I've built over the years. I have my own warehouses and, and so that I can stockpile millions and millions of, of um, uh, gowns and facilities and masks. And we have our own lab center. So we have one of the largest labs in the United States. Our main lab is 160,000 square feet. We can do up to 20,000 tests a day. So we, we, wanted, we were one of the first in the United States to do the PCR test. Um, and that helped us an awful lot. And we done only, not only did testing for our own staff, but we did it for everybody else on the outside. The other issue that we spent an awful lot of time on and it became the most complicated in any crisis like this is the availability and the deployment of staff. You have the right staff in the right locations on an ongoing, ongoing basis 24-7 over the course of a whole year. And uh, we had to do many, many things with regard to staff issues during that whole period of time. And that became the single most complicated issue. We dealt with it well but it became the most complicated. And I can go into that during the Q&A period if you wish. And the fourth area that became crucial was that we had set up right at the very beginning a clinical advisory group to give us advice clinically on what to be doing on a daily basis based upon the new knowledge that we were finding out on the treatment of COVID. Because if you remember, at the beginning, we knew very little about this disease. Um, and we learned as we went along. So you needed an infrastructure to continue to give us, the, uh, across the whole health system, a, a, a single set of advice about what to do. Now, as an organization, we're all one organization. We're very integrated. We've got single leadership, single clinical leadership. All, all functions are consolidated. We've got across the whole system, common protocol standards, et cetera. So that helped enormously. Um, so, where are we since then? Um, May, April was the worst month. Began to ease up in May. Uh, the numbers began to decrease. When we got to the early fall, we were down to about 100 inpatient COVID cases on a daily basis. In uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas period of time, the numbers increased again, and we jumped to 1,400 roughly inpatient cases on a daily basis. That number for us is relatively easy to handle. Uh, it didn't disrupt most normal operations. 
uh, a little bit, but not that much. And um, over the last two weeks, that number has been going down. So today, we are down to about 950 COVID patients. And it seems to be decreasing now on a daily basis, a number of, a number of cases a day. Uh, overall, in New York right now, the positivity rate is coming down. And of course, we're in the vaccination issue. We're dealing with vaccination right now. And we can talk about that during the Q&A period. Um, so on a daily basis here right now, we're handling normal operations. Most of our normal business is back. Um, we're involved, obviously, with extensive testing, PCR testing, both in the community and in the facilities. We're obviously dealing with the 950 COVID patients, and we're in the middle of a major vaccination effort for the region. We're one of the leaders in the region with regard to this. Um, uh, this will end. Um, I do believe that by the summer, middle of the summer, uh, no later than late summer, I believe that we will be um, out of a lot of this problem with regard to COVID. The issue I want to just point out, though, is that the economic impact of COVID in the economy here has been extraordinary. If you go through Man, if you went through Manhattan six months ago, it was empty. Um, if you go through Manhattan today, it's not that busy. Um, a lot of businesses have closed. Um, some of those businesses will never open again. Uh, if they do open, they'll be, um, you know, it will be not the same scale. So the economic impact of COVID is going to last for the next five to seven years, in my belief. So while COVID as a medical issue will disappear uh, or will be, will be on the sidelines, the economic impact, I think, is going to be the greatest challenge for us over the next couple of years. And as the largest employer in the region and the largest business in the region, this obviously has implications for us as well. So, so what I'd like to do now is just um, uh, mention a couple of the larger issues going forward. These are like leadership questions that I think we in healthcare, and for that matter, every organization has to figure out how to address. I have about eight points I'd like to make, and I'll do them relatively quickly because I know that um, uh, you, you know, you can take an extensive amount of time to go eat through each of these. And then, uh, but as I said at the beginning, I want to leave enough time for, uh, for Q&A. So the first issue, that, and it, all of these are lessons from COVID. The first issue is if you're in any kind of an organization today, how do you create an emergency management infrastructure and culture to prepare for the inevitability of things like this happening again? There will be other crises. Uh, may not, may be, may, it may not be as large uh, as this one, but they will happen. So how do you create that kind of an infrastructure inside your organization? So based on the lessons of what just happened, uh, how do you have the right um, uh, structure in place? So for example, what should we be doing right now with regard to supply chain? Um, the making or the purchasing uh, of, of masks and gloves and other protective equipment that you need. Uh, we were very reliant in China. That became a huge issue for us. Uh, not for us at Northwell because we were pretty well prepared, but became a huge issue for many other organizations. So how do we build, for example, going forward a surveillance system so that you can anticipate ahead of time what's happening? We do that pretty extensively now. We now can predict locally because of our local surveillance methodologies that we put together, uh, whether or not we're going to have a COVID case or cases coming in the next couple of days. And how do you put it, how do you uh, create uh, or, or uh, recruit the right kinds of people who know how to manage in a crisis, uh, how to prepare for a disaster, how to run a major, major command center, et cetera. So that's one major issue because the lesson here is we were not as well prepared, most organizations and the country was not well prepared when this occurred. So now the question is, how do we build that preparedness infrastructure for the future? Um, in our case at Northwell, we had actually put our uh, infrastructure, our preparedness infrastructure in place prior to 9-11. We've had this infrastructure here for a long time, and I can go into that during the Q&A. The second issue 
uh, which to me is a big one, is that how to maintain the culture of innovation and creativity that was so evident during the height of the crisis. During COVID, uh, we did extraordinary things unbelievably quickly. Um, the innovation was unbelievable. Uh, we agree, we, we, we ran, when we were having a problem with swabs through 3D printing, we made our own. When vents became an issue, we converted BiPAP machines to vents. When we needed overnight 200 new beds, we created 200 new beds overnight. These are the kinds of things that under normal circumstances would take weeks and months because you would spend all your time analyzing everything. But in a crisis, you just got to do it. And that innovation was facilitated here because government relaxed an awful lot of regulation. So the regulatory rel relaxation was unbelievably helpful to allow us to be flexible and creative. So now the question is, what regulations does government impose that were relaxed or taken away altogether during a crisis that don't ever again need to be put back in place? Um, that's a major issue that we should all be assessing uh, because in a crisis you become innovative and then in a non-crisis you become you have this tendency to go back to the old ways of doing business. The third issue is how to respond uh, to the changing nature of work. Uh, we now have 10,000 people working remotely. All of these people were in offices in our facilities pre-COVID. Um, the use of technology, of course, has facilitated um, the, uh, you know, holding people accountable, et cetera. And the fact that we're holding meetings like this shows the new way that the relationship with technology has changed. But the nature of work is going to change. Most businesses that I know, including ours, are going to have an extensive amount of people, large amounts of people working from home or in other remote locations. The question with that is how do you maintain not just only accountability, but how do you maintain a sense of uh, culture uh, when people are not together with you? How do you build that team orientation, that collaboration, that, that, that DNA of your organization? And now we put a lot of emphasis here on culture. How do you maintain that when a lot of your employees are going to be working remotely, completely different from what occurred prior to COVID? A uh, few others. How to create, and this is for healthcare, how to create an integrated care delivery system where all parts of the health system work together in complete synergy. Everything from primary care to ambulatory care to inpatient to post-acute to home. We have that in our organization. And one of the reasons that we were quite effective in dealing with COVID and became essentially the leader in New York in dealing with COVID is that all of our entities uh, are all part of one organization, all unbelievably coordinated together with common protocols and common standards. So I was able, by the way, during COVID, when one of our hospitals was getting overloaded with COVID patients, I was able to move those patients to other hospitals in our system. I was able to use our ambulatory network, our urgent care centers, our home care, uh, with um, a transport system, we have our own transport system here, the largest on the East Coast United States. So we were able to create that concept of systemness, getting away from the silo mentality of which the way healthcare is taught normally uh, run. So that's a major issue, I believe, for healthcare. How, how do you get all the pieces working together? We did it well during COVID. In our situation here, we did it well. Uh, so we have a full continuum. And um, patients, of course, have to be managed across that continuum. And how do we do that going forward? And how do we structure healthcare uh, uh, going forward? Large systems demonstrated a benefit during COVID. Uh, if you were a single standalone hospital in New York, back at the height of COVID, you were in terrible trouble. You could not have been able to handle it. But being in a large, large system made all the difference in the world. So I have a couple of others. Another uh, big issue for us as a result of the learnings of COVID is how do we promote respect for and investment in science and research? Um, 
we need to be investing a lot more uh, in, uh, in science going forward. And there's been an increasing disrespect for science and research, especially in the United States with our national leadership over the last four years. And that became unbelievably uh, complicated during the height of the COVID crisis. But even if you go back over the years, um, there has been less of a commitment to investment in research. And um, if the COVID demonstrates anything, is that you need to uh, continue and enhance dramatically in the investment in science and research going forward. That's a big issue for all of us. Um, another one is that is during COVID, we had to maintain high morale among staff, uh, maintain, maintain high commitment, maintain high satisfaction. And the question now for all organizations is how do we going forward continue to maintain and provide exceptional care for staff so that we just don't fall back to the kind of somewhat laissez-faire attitudes that we've had prior to COVID. Uh, we at Northwell always have done well with staff engagement and staff satisfaction. But one of the things that was pretty extraordinary is during COVID, our employee engagement dramatically rose. We, have, we jumped to the 91st percentile in employee engagement during COVID. And uh, we have the highest patient engagement scores today than ever before um, in our history, which is an extraordinary accomplishment given what went on here and is still going on uh, with COVID. And I have three others. One is how do we promote? And um, I think this is uh, obviously a question in Ireland and in Northern Ireland, and obviously in large parts of the United States, how we promote a change in the delivery of care going forward. Um, the site of care, for example, I believe that we have to dramatically expand outpatient uh, ambulatory care. Um, uh, the hospital should primarily going forward be places that take care of just chronic illness and sick people and obviously deliver babies, but everything else for the most part should be outside outpatient. And how do we now use technology to advance innovation in healthcare delivery? How do we do much more uh, virtual care, telemedicine, that accelerated with us during COVID. I believe it provides a wonderful, um, uh, has wonderful possibilities for what we should be doing going forward. Um, the other thing that, um, two other things with regard to this point is that um, COVID demonstrated the inequities and the disproportionate effect that it had in certain populations, especially populations of color over here. I'm sure the same thing has happened in, 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 in England and Northern Ireland and in Southern Ireland, where certain populations were disproportionately affected for a whole variety of reasons, whether they be social determinants of health or whether or not there be lack of access. And so we now have to deal with that issue going forward. It's going to be a huge priority here in the United States, and it's a major priority for us. And the other point here is that there People survive COVID, but there are, ex there are large numbers of people who will for a long period of time, we don't know that, how long it will be, that will be suffering the ill effects of COVID for a long time. Uh, we refer to them as the long haulers. These are people that a year ago had COVID, but today are still being affected by COVID. And how do we deal with the ongoing care of those people going forward is an issue that we have to be dealing with. And then the second last one that I'll mention, and I'm conscious of the time here, is um, if COVID demonstrated anything, it demonstrated the need for global, global and international cooperation. COVID was not a national issue, it was an international issue. Uh, and we have to be working with other countries more and more um, and this is very particular to the United States, where we kind of stepped aside from the rest of the world during the last four years. Uh, but this requires global cooperation and collaboration. We should be working together globally to develop the surveillance system so we can anticipate these things way in advance uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the best of our ability uh, um, to determine them in advance. And then we should be working internationally in a cooperative way to figure out how we yeah, collectively respond to crises like these. And I believe that with the new administration here in the US, 
uh, that at least there'll be an attempt to do this. Um, we should never again be totally dependent upon one country for the supply of basic supplies you need to fight a war like this. Um, so lots of issues in this, in this category uh, that um, I believe are very, very important now as we go forward. And the last generic point I'll mention is that this is a real wake-up call for government. Government, at least here in the United States, was terribly deficient on this. Um, New York state government did pretty well, but the national government was terribly deficient. Um, but it just didn't happen over the last couple of years. There was a lot of preparatory work that should have been done 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that wasn't. And government has this tendency to micromanage. The bureaucracy of government tends to overpower innovation by putting handcuffs on everybody. And I do think that government now, and I did, as you know, I spent a lot of time in government at one point, but I think government needs to sit back right now and assess what his role is in the future. Uh, you've got to allow those people that know how to do things to do them without getting them tied up unnecessary in, in unnecessary bureaucracy. You need government to plan for the future and take the long view, not just the short view, because how government reacts, especially in the area of healthcare, directly affects everybody else who actually delivers the healthcare. Over here, government, for the most part, does not deliver healthcare. They're regulated. And I'm just worried that they may get to the point of wanting to over-regulate as a result of COVID, rather than, in my view, actually setting the rules of the game and then get out of the way and let people do things that they know how to do and promote, as I said, the creativity that's necessary. And I will, uh, let me just conclude with one point and then we can go to wherever you wish to go on the cues and aids. Um, the key in all of this, and if there is one lesson, overall lesson during COVID um, is the following. One is that healthcare employees, people who work in healthcare at the front lines are extraordinary people. They do extraordinary work. They have, they, they, they have extraordinary compassion, commitment, dedication, and resilience. I observe it on an ongoing daily basis. I, I walk the floors of every facility during COVID. I was in every ICU, in every hospital. I still walk the floors. I still go out to every ICU. I've been in every COVID center. And when you're out there in person, and you're the leader of the organization, you're out there in person and you can go uh, directly talking to employees, you observe the ex extent of, what they, of which they went through. They went through extraordinary pressure and stress and they handled it unbelievably well. And from the leadership point of view in an organization, it's all about the people. If you have the right people, if you recruit the right people, if you have the people that can be unbelievably adaptable, uh, who can be tenacious, who actually are very comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we pointed that out in the book we wrote. Uh, I am very fortunate here. I have great staff and I have been recruiting those people for the last 20 years and nothing phases them. We did not stress out during COVID. Um, we didn't go into the bunker. It didn't... Um, uh, it, it didn't disrupt us in a major, major way. We actually handled it. And uh, as I tell staff all the time, you're judged not by what happens to you, but by how you react to it. So I think that healthcare reacted to the COVID crisis extraordinarily. We gained major trust in the community. The question now for us is to be able to maintain that trust going forward. And um, so the past year has been exciting say the least, um, it's been unique. But I believe that we are all better off because of it. Uh, none of us wish to go through this, but because of what it taught us, I think it has changed us. I think we're better off for it. I think that we will be a better organization because of it. It will force us to change and renew our commitment to efficiency and productivity and caring like never before. So there is also an upside to every crisis. And uh, I believe there is an upside here. This is not all uh, where people will say, oh my God, look what happened to us. Uh, it happened, we dealt with it, and now let's move forward. And we got to move forward with optimism and positivity. And I believe we'll be better off a year from now as a result of the experience we've been through. So let me stop here.
and allow enough time for questions. Um, it is hard to go through all of the various issues that we dealt with in a short period of time like this, but uh, I'll turn it over and I know Mark, I think you're gonna lead the questions, et cetera. So the questions are gonna hopefully be the better part of this. Thank you very much, Michael, for what I think everybody will agree was an absolutely inspiring talk. And it's great to see you again. Yeah, little did we think when we met in Queens just two years ago at your honorary graduation that the world would have changed so much. Uh, I remember we talked about potentially meeting up in New York, so hopefully that'll still be possible in the future. Uh, I can see some questions already coming in through the chat, and we've had some pre-questions that were sent in as well, but I'll take the chair's prerogative and just ask a few questions first. Uh, reading through your book, uh, Leading Through a Pandemic, which, by the way, I can highly recommend to all people around this webinar, and it should be compulsory reading for all hospital managers, for members of departments of health, and for government ministers. I was struck by both the scale and degree of preparation that you had undertaken at Northwell Health, and you mentioned this in your uh, talk. Uh, you were preparing for such an eventuality before 9-11, uh, which frankly impressed me incredibly. How do you plan for something like that over such a long period? Um, I think it's definitely something we could learn from here in the UK where our degree of preparedness has certainly been questioned. Well, uh, let me go back just a little bit, and thank you, Mark. Um, uh, I, I spend an awful lot of my time looking forward over the next, you know, I always look five to 10 years out and try to anticipate what might be happening. And years ago, uh, we're in the New York area, as you obviously know, we're right next to major airports. And it was inconceivable to me that we would not be affected by some major disaster at some point, given our location. And by the way, a year and a half before 9-11, I held a conference here that everybody laughed at me at the time, thought I was absolutely crazy. And the title of the conference was Weapons of Mass Destruction. And I hosted it in my organization and I invited every other healthcare organization in the region to come. Very few of them did, but I had a full house of my own staff. And we, we did it in combination with the National Law Enforcement Foundation and the FBI. And the key speaker at that time stood up in front of the room and laid out the terrorism issues that we were being, that were what the, the United States was worried about. And it was at that moment that he put up on the screen the big photograph of Osama bin Laden. And I will never forget, he actually said, this is the person that will attack the United States. So I remember walking out of that meeting and I says, well, if something is going to happen in the United States, New York is an obvious place. So we as an organization better get ready. So we started to put together and major in disaster infrastructure. And um, uh, we created a major command center with all of the data analytics and predictive modeling and all of that. And hired, we hired very, very good people to do this. And then over the years, you know, we had hurricanes, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy, which obliterated part of New York. So we were able to activate it during that period of time. We had SARS, we had JH1N1, et cetera. So every year since then, we have been upgrading our infrastructure, upgrading our facilities. Uh, we have mock plans on an ongoing basis So what to do if you have a crisis. This is also the reason we built our massive transport system. I have well over 150 ambulances on the road uh, and I have air transport, I have our own helicopter service. So all of that is in preparation because we, we believed and it became evident during the hurricanes we had that having an infrastructure like this was important. Now, that, not every organization did this. So back in January, when we were looking at what was going on in Wuhan, we just activated our command center and activated our infrastructure. There was no panic. Everybody knew what to do. We all have very specific roles. We have leadership and succession leadership every place. So that's the point I want to make, I think you're making. Every organization should be thinking about this. Bad things do happen. So it's easy to be successful during good times. The question is, are you prepared when something happens very quickly? That should be now a major goal of every organization, uh, an organizational leader going forward. So yes, we, were, we, were, we benefited from, from our history. Thanks very much, Michael. And I liked your phrase, comfortable in being uncomfortable. Uh, as you know, my focus is on cancer research, and we've been looking a lot at the direct impact of the pandemic on cancer services and cancer patients here in the UK. I'm really seeing significant impacts. I'm just interested as to what was your experience in Northwell Health specifically in relation to cancer, and how did you respond? 
Uh, well, uh, most of our most of our cancer delivery uh, is outpatient. You know, 85% of cancer is not hospital-based treatment. So most of our cancer services continued all during COVID. Um, so our, it's many of our cancer facilities are open. So um, there was some delay uh, on the surgical side. Uh, we and this was a very important. We created this clinical group. So we, I, we never made a decision that all elective should not happen or this kind of a procedure shouldn't happen. It was all case by case. So this clinical group reviewed every case. If somebody needed surgery, the, the, the clinical people, including the cancer people who were involved with this, um, decided on a case by case basis whether or not that surgery needed to be done now or whether it could be delayed. If it could be delayed safely, we delayed it. If it had to be done, we just did it. So the disruption in our cancer services was, was not major during COVID because it, uh, while the, all of the hospitals were dramatically affected, most of our cancer services are not in the hospital except for surgery. And the surgery that was necessary to be done was done. Thank you, Michael. And, and you're very much a lesson there because unfortunately here in the UK, a lot of decisions were made, blanket decisions, and I agree with you very much. It should be on a patient by patient basis. And yeah, the word elective becomes very dangerous because yeah. it, to the public, it seems like it's the belly tuck, you know, or, you know, you get the Botox in the forehead <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but elective surgery can be major, major urgent surgery. You've got to make the case case by case. Absolutely. Going to go to some of the questions then from people. Um, question here, you know, from a leadership perspective, this was a massive operation. How did you continue to plan and lead from the front and inspire your staff in what was obviously a tremendously difficult situation, particularly when you had to work remotely? And I know you've sort of touched on this, but maybe in more detail. Right. Um, well, you know, you lead from the front and you lead from the rear. Um, uh, we communicated with staff continuously, multiple times a day, because staff needs the information. Once they know what's going on, it makes them comfortable. We also provided extraordinary support for staff. For staff that didn't want to go home because they were worried about their families, we provided hotel rooms. We provided daycare. We created in each facility what we call tranquility tents. Next to every facility, people could take a break go into this quiet room with quiet music, et cetera, and just relax. They're, they're, they're now with us permanently. Um, we, we walk the floors all the time. Uh, not a day went by that I wasn't out on the front lines with staff. And I can tell you, I don't think there is anything more important during a crisis than to have leadership walk the front lines. One, it, people want to belong to a cause. People don't want to work for an organization. They want to belong to something. And we were fighting a war. This was a war against the virus. People will do extraordinary things during a war like this if you let them know that they're appreciated and you do it in person, you do it in the constant communication. We used every communication tool we possibly could. Um, so the morale in our staff was pretty extraordinary. And when I'm out there even, I was out uh, two days ago walking the floors and people will high five me and say, we've got this. No, this, we can take care of this. Uh, we knew, and the other thing was, we were able to tell our staff from day one that we would be able to keep them safe, that there was gonna be no shortage of masks, no shortage of gloves, no shortage of face shields, because I had my own warehouses. I had all of that built up before um, as part of our infrastructure and disaster preparedness system. So when you were able to tell staff, don't have, you don't have to worry about masks. And by the way, just give you a statistic. We were using surgical masks. We were using 150,000 surgical masks a day, every day. Yet I would never run close to running out. And when I was able to tell staff, we, we have all the equipment you will ever need to take care of you during this crisis, I cannot tell you what that meant to them, the morale of the staff on an ongoing basis. Um, but it's you got to you've got to be out there. And yeah. for me personally, um, I know people tell me it's dangerous to be in the ICUs and the in, in the areas where everybody was being intubated. I you know to me I said okay well it, that might be dangerous but I'm doing it anyway. And so did our other leadership. That made a huge difference. Communication, communication, communication. 
absolutely. Uh, Michael, you, you mentioned uh, long COVID, and the, one of the questions that has come in from the audience, because it's been a big issue here in the United Kingdom, um, how have you dealt with long COVID? Well, we're trying to figure that out, Mark. I mean, um, we had a discussion actually yesterday about whether we could up, set up a special COVID clinic uh, specifically designed to take care of people who are, have ongoing effects of COVID. Um, uh, we are doing research. We've written, done a lot of research papers on this. We're trying to assess the results of all of those research papers that we did as to what it means. I don't think we have an answer yet, um, and, but I do think there will be large numbers of people that will be suffering from things that they never before suffer from, um, uh, but they now are because of COVID. And we will just have to figure out a better way to respond. And I think we'll require a focused program for long haulers that we will have to address. And I believe that we will. Uh, we're in currently having a discussion about it. No, very, very important point. Um, another thing that's come up uh, very much, I welcomed and have a num number of people in the audience have welcomed your focus on science and the importance of science. Just in relation to things like budget, I mean, how much of your budget do you spend on research and innovation? And also how, how much do you think the government should be upping uh, their, their spend on research and innovation? Particularly? Uh, I think government should be doubling the amount that they spend on research. And, in, and, and this is investments in NIH and a lot, you know. So, um, and I think the new administration here, the Biden administration is committed to that. I mean, they have a whole different view. I mean, the previous administration, I mean, you know, science to them, they didn't uh, have any clue what that meant. And of course, it came from the top. Um, and the problem was, of course, and it's also even a problem with vaccination hesitancy now, where you had uh, uh, Trump for a long time, you know, coming up with fake treatments and fake this and questioning whether or not the, the vaccine should be developed the right way he wanted to short circuit the process. You now have a problem with that with regard to the hesitancy. Um, here inside our organization, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year in research. We have a major, major research entity. It's a major part of our organization. Um, and our, by the way, all during COVID, our research leaders were involved every single day. They were part of the clinical advisory group that we set up to make the scientific empirical, ju empirical judgments as to what we should be doing with regard to the various treatments the mode of treatment, et cetera. And back to your previous question, we were communicating with our staff, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our physicians on a daily basis about the new types of treatments that we thought were necessary to proceed with. And when we had a good outcome in one place clinically because of some treatment methodology, we then applied that treatment across the board. But it was all done by our scientific leadership and our clinical leadership. This was not something I did. This was something my clinical leadership did. And that communication about how to handle the care and the treatment methods and the treatment processes um, made all the difference in the world to staff because they were hearing publicly about hydroxychloroquine and about this and about that. And the media confuses the whole thing. So you needed a definitive uh, communication about what was real at the, as, as best we knew about it. Uh, because at the beginning we knew very little but that communication was crucial. No, but it was brilliant. all science-based. It was all science empirically based. No, that's brilliant. And, and that sort of you know, link between science and that translation of science straight away as rapidly as possible into better care is really important. Oh, and you mentioned on the budget overall, um, during, the one lesson here is during a crisis, throw the budget out the window. <laughs> Forget your budget. Yeah, no, I, I, loved your, I loved your comments. You had it several times in your book. You just said... Yeah. Just throw the budget out. Get the goddamn oh, budget because you're <laughs> going to invest in what you need to invest in to do the right thing. And if you worry about the budget, you're going to be in a psych war. Just forget the budget. We lost oh. um, we lost in revenue in the first three months one and a half billion dollars. Yeah, no. Absolutely. And we spent four hundred fifty five hundred million more in extra expense. So the budget didn't mean much. Yeah. If crisis eases, then you get back to normal operations. You get your budget. A um, couple of more questions coming in on the chat. Uh, one, uh, people without health insurance, how did COVID affect them? Uh, we take care of every... Now, this is something that a lot of people don't fully understand. We take care of everybody, irrespective of whether they have insurance or not. It made no difference. Nobody is turned away. Nobody gets uh, 
as a second level of treatment during COVID. We take care of everybody irrespective of whether they have COVID or not. And all of the hospitals in the area did the very same thing. And awesome. now if you live in certain communities, access may be a little bit more complicated, et cetera. But when you get to our facilities, uh, no questions asked. Uh, we never ever turn away anybody ever, even before pre-COVID, we never turn away anybody just because they don't have insurance. Uh, ever do that. Uh, we, we, we eat the cost. I, uh, we give away hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of free care a year. Um, um, it, it causes a financial issue for us at times, but we never turn anybody away. That's our philosophy. Well, that's great. That's the way medicine should be. Yeah. Question here in relation to advice for leaders and how do they work through pandemic fatigue for both themselves and their teams? Uh, well, one, it's teamwork, uh, it's support um, that you provide one another. Um, it's the, the support you provide to staff, like some of the things I mentioned before on, on um, uh, the tranquility tents and all of these other things we did. The other thing we did though, uh, which is important, that you know when we shut down a lot of our ambulatory sites, which uh, we actually used, we, did, we deployed those staff. We moved staff from some of our hospitals that were less um, uh, under pressure with COVID to other parts of our organization. We went and we, bay, way back in January, two months before we had our first COVID, we entered into an agreement with a national, a national um, staffing agency. And we spent millions of dollars pre-hiring staff in case we ever would need them. So we brought extra staff in. The other thing that happened, which is pretty interesting, is I reached out to other health systems around the country, um, uh, like Intermountain in Utah, et cetera, and uh, asked if they would help us. They sent us staff from the Midwest. I sent my staff to Texas. I sent many of my staff to Georgia. I sent my staff, sent my staff to Utah. So the big systems in the United States, I now have an, a, an agreement with the other big systems in the United States that it's a reciprocal agreement. If I'm in trouble, they help me. If they're in trouble, I help them. And one point, just tell you about the staff. I have enormous, enormous uh, respect for staff. Right after the height of our crisis, I sent a memo out to staff to see how many people would be interested in traveling to other parts of the country to help out those places in disaster and spend two weeks in other states. And even though they had been through a horrific epicenter here because we had more COVID than anybody, I got a thousand people saying yes, that were willing to travel to other parts of the country. Oh, by the way, on the number, we have actually seen 160,000 COVID patients since the beginning of the pandemic a year ago. That's very impressive, Michael, that commitment of people. I uh, really, really think that's superb. Uh, Michael, what, what would you have done differently? What would I have done uh, differently? Um, uh, let me just, well, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> that's a very interesting question uh, because it worked pretty well for us. I would be better prepared staff-wise in the future. For example, um, we have, I have 75,000 people, but we didn't know exactly they, 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 um, they must know what I'm looking for. Um, the abilities of every staff nurse of what actually they could do or what their experience was. So because we had people in the ICU, so had both for our physicians and our docs, having more information about uh, their, their CVs, their resumes of what their competencies really are and have it in a... Um, a kind of a repository so that you don't have to be trying to find that out in the middle of a crisis. You know it beforehand so you can deploy much more easily. Um, that probably would be one of the things. Um, our infrastructure worked quite well. Um, I'd have had more vents because we had to minute, we had to create vents to create ICU beds. I would have had more of those. Um, I would, um, uh, I would have probably uh, more definitive plans about how to build more space in our facilities because we had to do it very, very quickly. And 
we uh, right now we have we would if a big crisis happened today for us we would be in much better situation because we'd gone through all of this but overall um i am gifted by having unbelievably talented people so the people that ran my man my disaster preparedness infrastructure i mean you cannot phase these people um and uh the, the key would be is making sure you hold on to those people that they don't leave. And when they do leave, you replace them with people with common, with the same kind of competencies. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I'm a big believer. It doesn't matter about, you know, structure is important, but the most important thing are the people that you've got and making sure that we retain the right kinds of people going forward will be key. Um, but we didn't, uh, as I said earlier, we did not stress out too much during this. Uh, it bonded everybody together, in fact, even more. I mean, even though we were working remotely, we were together all the time uh, remotely, and it was 24-7. Michael, obviously a superb team. Again, I would encourage everybody who's on this uh, webinar to read Michael's book. I'm now going to pass over to Dr. Joanne Murphy, my colleague, who's co-director of the Center for Leadership, Ethics, and Organization, uh, to make a few comments. Thank you for that, for that, Mark. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks, Michael, for those really fantastic insights. And I think what they do is they give us really key leadership lessons for leading through volatility, through leading through crisis, and the importance of resilience in these types of environments. And I think some of your comments in terms of preparing and building infrastructures, um, early warning systems that allow us to develop those types of resilient processes are incredibly important. I think what you've also told us about in, in, in really emotive terms is just how significant cultivating a culture of preparedness is alongside the sort of innovation and creativity you were able to bring to your leadership and your leadership teams and your organization in such a difficult uh a difficult situation. One of the things that really came home to me was just the centrality of communication in terms of your leadership and how important you see communication as and really the people's experience in these processes, your people and also the people that you were helping. And I think you've talked about this in, a, in another environment as the, you know, the horrific, but also the heroic processes that people go through and the significance of recognizing that. And of course, that speaks to the human aspects of the leadership challenge, but also to the technical aspects, making sure that those resilient systems are in place. I know you've also talked about the significance of team building, of building collaborative cultures, and very emotively with us today, the importance of when you put your staff on the front line, that you have to be on the front line with them. And I think that's one of the kind of key messages that's come across to us today when you've spoken about your experiences. I think what strikes me too is how upbeat and optimistic you are. And I know that that's a leadership philosophy that you actively uh, promote. And that's you know incredibly important to those of us who are looking at our leadership practice and trying to develop it further. But also about the significance of being trustworthy, of creating those kinds of unity processes within, within staff and holding yourself to account in the most difficult of circumstances. So I think that these are incredibly important lessons and learning, not just for now, uh, but for our organizations and our communities and our societies indeed going forward. So with those lessons in mind, it's now time to bring this fantastic and, and incredibly useful event to a close. Before we all leave, I would like to thank Michael Darling most warmly on behalf of Queen's University, our Chief Executives Club at Queen's and every one of us who has attended this event for spending this time with us and for giving us such an inspirational talk on leadership and most importantly, why leadership matters in the most difficult of circumstances. I would also like to thank Michael's colleagues, Jason Phillip and Jeannie Gabriel for their help in facilitating this meeting today. And I would like to thank our Queen's Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian Greer and his colleague, Nicholas Skelly for extending the invitation to Michael and their part in today's event. Thanks, of course, also go to Professor Mark Lawler for so ably fielding these questions coming in to Michael today from all of those watching. And thanks, of course, to everybody who has attended today for engaging so warmly in what has been a wonderful experience. 
A recording will be made available afterwards on the Chief Executives Club web pages. Should any of those watching wish to refer a colleague to see this inspirational talk of Michael's. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.